Hello friends, welcome back to the channel and thank you for joining me today for part five of my 12 part near death experience compilation. Today we're going to be hearing from people on their experiences with Jesus Christ. This is going to be part one of people's experiences with Jesus Christ. So we're going to be hearing from multiple near-death experiencers, one right after another, on what it was like to be with Jesus Christ. If you'd like to connect with any of my guests, I will have their names displayed on the screen as they are speaking, and I will have each of them listed in the description box with their contact links. If you'd like to connect with me, you can also find my links to my social media in the description if you'd like to support this channel. Thank you for watching. That helps out a, a lot just by itself, but my Patreon link is also in the description box. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoy. Next thing you know, I'm in this different place and I look who's holding my hand and it's Jesus and he's so beautiful. He's so beautiful. He's holding my hand and uh, his face, he's like radiating. He's like so much light coming out of him. He's got really pretty teeth. He's got a really great smile. They never show it. They really should because he's got really great teeth. And he was leaning down and he was holding my right hand and <clears throat> I said, you're that man I talked to. And he goes, I am. And he says, I have something for you. And I said, a toy, because you know, I'm five years old and he thought that was funny and he laughed and he goes, and he goes, no. And he took off a piece of his rope belt and he wrapped it on my left wrist. And he said, <laughs> he said, um, much as, much is given much you'll give through the small things the big things will be done and through the big things the small things will be acknowledged and then he talked about always looking out for me and and he would give me favor and that he had something important to ask of me but i had to go back and i argued a lot <laughs> that i did not want to go back at all and i said i can't do it <laughs> i can't do this world and he said but look at your mom. And it was sort of like that movie with like Jimmy Stewart. And he said, look at your mom. And, I, and she was crying and I went, she'll be okay. And, uh, and he's like, no, you need to go back and show her what love is. And I said, I don't know how to do that. And he laughed and he said, well, there's really no right or wrong way to do that. And I said, no, she'll be, she's fine. She'll be okay. <laughs> and, and I said, I don't want to go back. And I was kind of running around him. It was this beautiful, it looked like a pasture. It was all, the colors were gorgeous. And it was like really, really green. And I think that's why now I, I like, I always love Technicolor movies. It's just so bright. And I still love bright colors now, but the grass was so green. And he goes, okay, you can stay for a little bit and we'll talk. And, and so he said, follow me. So we started walking in this beautiful pasture. And as he walked, every blade of grass followed him, every flower, every cloud, every tree, everything followed him. And it was just as though there, the love that they had for him and worshiped him. Now he doesn't like to be that whole worship thing he really doesn't but that's what they were they would the, everything was reacting to him i was even going does he know that everything's following him even just every petal of on a flower everything was following him and acknowledging him and he said i could ask him anything that i wanted and um I asked him things like, um, they seem stupid now that I think about it, but I asked him, why are we here? I asked him about, I know I asked him about energy, like how does energy work? But then instantly I knew and I just didn't care about it. And we went in front of this really big tree and he said, we don't eat from this tree. It's a wise tree. And I'm thinking, okay, I wasn't thinking about it. And it was, it looked like a cherry cherry blossoms 
uh, you know, they're white, or you want to call them Japanese cherry bell. They're white, or they could look like a dogwood. It was white flower tree, but it had red grapes on it. And and he, there was a rock in front, a big rock. He said, we'll sit here and talk. And I was like, okay. And then he started telling me about uh, energy. And he said that how they manifest in heaven, they think and it's instant. He said, but it takes longer on earth. So you have to really be mindful uh, to put positive things out there and make sure because this, it was that you'll put it in the world. And he said, but it's quick here. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, we do things here. You think about it and you're there. If you want to go skiing on the Alps, you think about it and it's there. And I said, I want to try. And he goes, okay. So I visualized us being in a little boat and we were in a little boat. And then, um, three or four little fish came up to him and he picked one up and he said something to it like hello or something he said something to the fish and then he put it back in he goes that's how we fish here so he basically just talked to the fish and then he put it back in there and it was almost like the water it was it was like the water was alive and it was uh is you could breathe in the water, but it was like, it was like a different, cause it looked like water, but it was more than that. It was richer. It was, it was alive. It had more like iridescence in it. It looked different and everything was just so alive, much more than here. And then he told me that, uh, we spent time together. I, I he answered a lot of things. Come to find out I was in a coma three days, which I spent with him. <laughs> so I'm not too upset about that. Uh, highlight of my life, uh, I can tell you. Uh, but the love that he had was supernatural. It was like all the people you've ever loved and they loved you. That's just like, I mean, it doesn't even touch it. I mean, it, it's so intense. The love is just... Uh, There's just nothing like it. There's nothing like it. There's, there is not, it's just not human. <laughs> it's not a human love. It is like, there's, it's all accepting. It's, um, it's, um, no wrong, no judgment. It's just love. And it is an overwhelming amount. I mean, it's just a lot. And so I really didn't want to leave that. Um, he did tell me I had to go back. And I did. And then I could just feel something coming. I could feel this presence coming. And it was big. And um, I, I say Jesus because I believe it was Jesus, but could have been God. I don't know. But it felt to me like Jesus. And he, I couldn't see him. Again, I couldn't see him, but I could feel him. And his presence was so strong. And he was at the foot of my bed. And I said to my husband, oh, Jesus is here. And my husband went, no, Jody, there's no one here. I said, yes, yes, Jesus is here. And the feeling was he wasn't just there for me. He was there for everyone in that ward, everyone in ICU. And then I just felt the most, it was like a, a big wave of love, of all the love in the world, just crashing over my body and crashing over me. And it was so amazing. And I, I said to my husband, oh, my, oh, he's just, this is amazing. You know, like I was, <laughs> and my poor husband's sitting there going, there is no one here, Jody. There's no one here. And I'm going, yes, there is. Jesus is here. Jesus is here, you know. Then I started to sort of talk a bit more to my husband about this place I'd been and this voice I'd heard and this presence that I'd felt. And I said to him, it was Jesus. And I said, I was in this like, I call it a black void. Um, so I don't believe I went to heaven. I didn't go into the light or through the light. I went to this black, black void, but it wasn't black like nothing there and felt cold or awful. It was a beautiful black and it was like a soft charcoal. It was very floaty. I was floating. I knew this person, Jesus, was next to me. I knew it was Jesus. Um, I knew he was male um, and he was talking to me and what I mainly remember from it, I don't remember our full conversation, 
what I mainly remember is this feeling of he felt like a brother or a father figure, sort of really paternal and really caring. He didn't feel um, like I had to bow down to him or be in awe of him. I felt like his equal, like like a like a mate, like a friend, um, and that we'd known each other you know, for ages, like how you do with your friends. And that, that we just got on really well. He was funny. He was really funny. I remember laughing a lot. Um, but I mainly remember him showing me my husband and daughter's life, like a, like a little movie uh, of what their life would be like. And he showed me her growing up, um, becoming older. And he showed my husband meeting another woman. Um, he didn't show me, I don't remember seeing any more children um, of, of them, of, the, of who my husband would end up with. But he basically, it was like a knowing that if that's what happened, if I was no longer there, if I passed away, they would be okay, that everything would be fine and it would be how it was supposed to be. And they would just have a different life journey than they would have if I was there bringing up my daughter and with my husband and that that was okay it wasn't I didn't feel anything about it I just thought oh okay that's cool I felt really okay with it and really accepting of it and um, I saw my daughter and what she looks like now actually very similar to what she looks like now um, she's 12 years old now and um, I saw her like that and she had her trials and tribulations and her angsts and, and they still went through, you know, difficult times and, and missed me and things like that. But it was just a different life experience and they would learn different lessons and have um, kind of different knowledge from those experiences. So that's how it kind of played out to me. I don't remember having a choice. No, no one said to me, you, you can stay or go. There was no choice. I just suddenly was back. Now I'm in this like horrible place and my sense was is that I was stuck there forever and ever and ever and ever time without end with all these other miserable people. Mm -hmm. um, very, very depressing. And in that despair, I remembered my childhood in Sunday school singing, Jesus loves me. And in addition to the words, I felt that as a child and remembering it, I could remember what I felt as a child, that there was this other whom from a childhood perspective was kind of like a superhero, this guy, Jesus, who wore, mm -hmm. you know, the, the robe and the beard and the long hair. Yeah. But he would um, he would chase the monsters away, you know, at night and protect me from harm when the bullies were after me in the schoolyard and stuff, you know. Uh -huh. I prayed to him and like he he'd he'd protect me. And I wanted him back. But I didn't know if he was real or not real. When I was a kid, I thought he was real. And then I'd spent my adulthood thinking he wasn't real. Mm -hmm. But then I also knew this is it. I, I just knew this was this was my this was my chance and my only chance. And I needed to take it. So I called out to him as powerful as I could, Jesus, please save me. And with that, a tiny light appeared in the darkness. And it got very bright, white light, um, brighter than the sun. And it was overwhelming because it was so bright. I wasn't afraid, but I didn't know if it was going to just um, consume me. It was so bright. Mm -hmm. But instead, it was wonderful and filled with love. So it wasn't really light. It was a radiance, but it wasn't light like we know it. 
because it didn't have the harmful effects of that bright of light. Right. Uh, just the opposite. And out of it emerged Hanson Armson. Um, he reached down and touched me. And when he touched me, I could see that I was all gore. And when he touched me, all that gore just went away. And I was intact. All the pain was gone. And he filled me with love that's indescribable. And what we know as love, what we experience in this world as love, doesn't even begin to compare to his love, his great love, which is so much greater. And his hands went behind my back and he picked me up and held me close to him and put his arms around me and began to stroke my back gently like a mother or father would do with their child. So I buried my face into his chest and cried like a baby. And I was happy beyond anything I'd ever known, just being held by him. That's why I was crying because I was, I mean, so happy. And then I realized we were traveling upward. <laughs> We, I, I, I didn't, I had missed the takeoff, but we were just gently going up and we were starting to, and I, and I could feel that we were going faster and faster and faster. And I felt embarrassed about burying my head in his chest and crying like a baby and, and not not very becoming <laughs> to my new friend. <laughs> and uh, I turned my head to look at where we were going and I saw what looked like a galaxy of stars and quickly realized that they weren't stars because they were all moving in different directions in this great galaxy of trillions and trillions and trillions of lights, beings, beings of light. And I knew profoundly and clearly that God was in there, in that, mm -hmm. and that this was heaven. And this, actually what I thought was this is heaven, this is God's house. Mm -hmm. That's what I call it, God's house. And so to this day, I, I always think of heaven as home because it's where we belong. Mm -hmm. where we came from and where we need to go back to. Right. And home is also where we're really loved and we're really known and we can really be ourselves, you know? And I thought to myself, he's made a terrible mistake. I'm a piece of garbage. I don't, belong here, he should put me back. And we stopped outside of home, heaven. Mm -hmm. And he said, we don't make mistakes. You belong here. And I thought, how do you know I thought that because I didn't say it. I only thought it. And he said, I know everything you've ever thought. And I thought, that's not good. <laughs> There's lots of things that I've thought that I don't want you to know that I've thought. And when I thought that, I started to think of all the kinds of things that I thought that I didn't want him to know that I thought. Mm -hmm. So, as an aside, bad idea to start doing an inventory of the things that you don't want to think about. Right. <laughs> Come into your everything. mind. Yeah. Anyhow, he started laughing. And at first I didn't understand what he was laughing about. And then 
finally I figured it out that he thought it was funny me trying not to think about the things that I didn't want him to know that I was thinking about. He has a wonderful sense of humor. He's a really funny guy. But in, more, from my perspective, even more importantly, he thought I was funny. <laughs> I mean, it doesn't matter that I think he's funny. The, the good thing is he thinks we're funny. I'm trying to pick up my head, but I felt this being coming towards me. It was beautiful, this love, this everything all at once. And he's wearing this white robe gold belt and a purple sash. This is all I could see because I couldn't even pick up my head. I was just trying to lift and I couldn't pick it up. And he asked me again if I wanted to come home. It was like three times. He asked me three times. Oh my gosh. Number three. And so, and I said yes. But it, I felt this this pain. Like he didn't want me to go, but he, he understood that I needed to come. Does it make sense? Like it was... And so... Um, I did not see his full face. I just saw a beard and a little bit of the, sh the hair kind of wavy, curly. I couldn't even, even quite, it's not straight, not straight. And, and this whole area was just flash of white light. And so all of a sudden, when I say yes, I just whoop, I'm back into the earth. I knew he was my savior. A lot of people call him different names, but I just call him my savior. Mm. You know, everybody here, I, when I was telling a story to many friends that, you know, they're Christians, they were like, well, that was Jesus. This is it. I don't care. I just know that he was my savior. I was a member of the youth choir in my church, and it was a good Friday. And we had been asked to go to a neighboring church to sing. And so I went and by that time I was real um, shy and backward and quiet. And so I was sitting in the way back and there were two levels and we were down at the bottom uh, on the bottom floor and we were practicing to go up into the main church to sing our, our part. And actually the song was up to Jerusalem. I'll never, I'll never forget it. So I'm sitting there in the back by myself and then there's two women sitting in front of me. And then in front of them was two of the daughters of one of the women. Okay. And then in front of them was the rest of the choir. And we had a big choir, lots of instruments, lots of singing parts and so on. So I'm, I'm sitting in the back and then there's this, <laughs> there was only one door in and one door out. And it was a big wooden door and it was right onto the street. And that was it. And mm -hmm. so I'm sitting there and I don't know where this man came from <laughs> because he didn't come through the door. But anyway, he, he walks in and as soon as as soon as I see him from a distance, I could tell that, um, the energy in the room changed. It was lighter and brighter and and just, I don't even know how to explain it, but the whole energy changed. And I knew that there was great holiness in the room. And that as he walked closer to me, I could see who it was. And I was <laughs> sitting there, a 15 year old girl. And I was like, oh my God, that's Jesus. <laughs> and so he sits down right next to me and he, he smiles at me and he says, where do I go to sit? My, my mouth went just as dry as a bone. I couldn't say a word. My tongue felt like it was this big, you know? And I was like, oh. I didn't know what to say. So the two women that were sitting in front of me, they turned around and they started to answer his question and tell him where to go to sit. And at the same time that he was talking to them, he looked at me and he said, what is happening to you in your life is happening. You are not crazy. I love you. I'm with you. Don't be afraid. And then he got up and when he got up, he put his finger on the elbow of the lady in front who had arthritis so bad, she couldn't bend her arm. And so he healed her arm. And then he went upstairs and he was sitting in the main church and the main church had this gigantic stained glass window. I mean, all the pews were in front of this window. So, I mean, you had to sit in front of this window. No, there was no place else to go. So he's sitting there and he's like in the first or second pew. 
and we're up on the I don't know if it was an altar or a stage or what it was, but it was an elevated area. And so we were sitting up there and we were singing. And I couldn't tell you if there was anybody else in that church or not, because I only had eyes for him. And I sang my heart out to him. It was like, I've never sang like that before, you know, just feeling it so strong. And it was just for him. At one point, he put his hands over his face like this. And I don't know if he was praying or remembering or, or crying. I don't know what he was doing. But when he got up after we were done singing, uh, the two girls that were sitting in front of the two ladies, he had told them that he had, he liked our singing. And then he disappeared. He just, well, as he started to walk away, it was like, <laughs> he just disappeared. And um, one of the ladies is still alive. And we talk about it all the time. She remembers. And even over the course of many years, I would contact these, you know, these ladies off and on. Did we really see that? Did that really happen? Am I crazy? Nope. We saw him. He was there. <laughs> so, um it, it was, he was so beautiful and it was, and what I find interesting is that he said exactly what I needed to hear, you know, mm -hmm. he, and I never told anybody, you know, so I know that he reads our hearts. And so he knew what was in my heart and he said exactly what I needed to hear to keep me from doing that. And he healed that other lady. And then what he said to the other girls, you know, but there was just me and four other women that saw him. Nobody else on the choir did. And when I, we would say, oh my gosh, you know, did you see Jesus? They were like, Jesus, where was Jesus? We didn't see him. <laughs> well, he was sitting right there in front of you. <laughs> you know, but, but they didn't. Just me and four other women oh. saw him. He is probably, I'd say 5'10", 5'11", tall. He's muscular, but slim built. Um, he had dark olive complexion. He had beautiful brown eyes and very long, dark, wavy hair. I mean, very long, not just up to here, but long. And a close cut beard and he had dimples when he smiled. And what I found interesting about his eyes were when he was sitting next to me, his eyes were brown. But the more I look, when he was talking to me, I looked deep into his eyes and it was like I could see his soul and his eyes turned this beautiful blue color. Even though they wow. were brown, I could see this blue, this brilliant sky blue. And it was like I was looking into his soul and his soul was so perfect and so spotless. And I'm you know, everybody says your eyes are the mirror to your soul. And so that's what I was seeing was his mm -hmm. spotless soul. And it, it it looked like this sky blue with no clouds, no stars, not, you know, just brilliant, beautiful blue. And so I kind of backed up a little bit, you know, and it was like, <laughs> I looked at him again and they were brown again. And it was like, so he, he was, he was just beautiful. It was beautiful.